Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's rather easy. Um, um, yeah, can we also like, we, we have our YouTube account. Um, would you mind if we also like uh, post the, the recording over there? Oh, please do. Okay, sure. Uh, would you like us to send the recording to you as well? Yeah. All right, we will do. I'll put it on my YouTube, but I'll also link to your YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's great. I'm not very famous on YouTube, but <laughs> maybe I will be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Mm, we can wait like a few more minutes for people to, to come over and then we can start. Are there people there? I can't really see. <laughs> uh, yeah, there are some people. Like, or just you and Stefan. <laughs> no, no, there's like a few more. Um, so. like, yeah, we, we see kind of like, mm, especially like in January, like when it was difficult with COVID, you know, not so many people uh, attend. Um, but yeah, they're like coming. Okay, cool. Yeah, you should all sit right there and pretend to be a big audience. <laughs> You should unmute so I can hear some background noise. Yeah. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. Yeah, we can see. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jacob Nelson here. Uh, he's also at his class, Jeremy, uh, which is the uh, professor. And um, 
see an astrophysicist, researcher, and uh, scientific division and our specialist. Uh, and uh, he's also known for his contribution to the study of the supermassive black holes. Uh, he's also the president of uh, of Inside STEM, which uh, uh, is a uh, is, is, uh, is doing an education in Africa, uh, STEM education in Africa, and uh, tonight he's gonna he's gonna tell us a little bit about that and uh, what he thinks uh, uh, is very important uh, the outreach in, the, in those places. All right, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I guess we can start now. You're much louder than anyone speaking from behind the computer is so. <laughs> yeah. I heard Stefan. So thanks for the intro. I wish I could make you bigger so I could see any reactions or whatever. At some points, I will like you to be reacting and doing things in the talk. And I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. but you know what happens these days, but hopefully we're recording everything and it will be there. Um, if at any point you want to ask questions, please run up towards the screen and ask them because I'm very, very happy to be interrupted and speak to you in the meantime. I hope that I sound loud and okay to you. If you like wave and say hello, then I'll believe it's true. No, I mean, yeah, we, we hear you very well. Wave. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> now I believe you. <laughs> Even though you're teeny weeny in my screen, I wish I could make that bigger, but we can't. So we'll do it in Zoom. But anyway, I'm talking about this issue, which I think can be of interest to you in terms of, I think, your interest across the international development kind of spectrum across the world and how especially the frontiers of science should not be just for the rich, but how you should be democratizing STEM learning. And STEM means science, technology, engineering, mathematics, which is sort of that whole science learning thing, how the education should not just be for the rich. If you read the what I sent about the talk, you see things like that, first of all, this all started when some guys went to the moon. NASA sent people to the moon. America sent people, people to the moon. Those guys who went to the moon were all Anglo-Saxon, heterosexual, cisgender, all American guys went there. They left a plaque on the moon saying they went there on behalf of all mankind. But did they really mean it? Was that really there? Here is what they said. Here, men from the planet Earth first set foot upon the moon on July 1969, AD, very Christian, came in peace for all mankind, signed by Neil Armstrong, Michael Collins, Edward, Edward Armstrong, the current president at the time, Richard Nixon, who, as you know, later resigned and was almost impeached, but didn't get that far before he quit. And so this was the, this, you know, is a situation of exploration through the universe that we have, that everyone went there and this was how the funding was made, how the people went, who went there. And it's really important to start thinking about those issues in terms of the world of all mankind. And what was the basis of that? Even if you look at the pictures now, in the um, front row of this picture are the first seven ever NASA astronauts. And in the second row are the next nine, which was the next ones. And these were the ones that went to the moon. If you can pick out who is Neil Armstrong, who is Buzz Aldrin, who is anything you know, I'd be impressed because you don't know. Because again, you're just looking at this scenario of these very, 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 very straight white male, all American guys, which is what NASA decided to send, spend all their money on to send them to the moon. And they even had to be married. They had to have children already with their wife, which they had to be married to 
there was a lot of conditions for you to be to the moon. So you better believe that you're in this category if you've got to the moon. Then you have this impression that the US is who spends the most money on getting science everywhere. But actually, if you look at this graph, the US is not actually the most per person. It's very high, but Norway does actually spend more. Netherlands is well up there in the list. Other countries are less. But in the top 20 countries that are spending money on science and technology, there's not that much of a difference between them. There is a big range, but the US is not the most, but certainly dominate the vocabulary of science, even though like Norway, Austria should be really dominating and countries all the way down this list should be also. While you see the little blob in the Southern hemisphere at the top of South America, anyone know? Can't tell because you're too little. <laughs> Do you know what that is? <laughs> Guiana. Yes, French Guiana. So that's also part of France. So that's why that gets that bonus and also is basically just the launch pad for Europe and everywhere where the James Webb Space Telescope was launched from. So that's why that gets to be there. South Korea spends a lot. Japan spends, you know, as much as Spain. Portugal is not in the list, which is unfortunate in Western Europe. And so you see. The point there being, especially that per citizen in the top 20, you're all in this bubble in the world, or Australia and Japan, South Korea. China could be there also. China spends a lot more money. India spends a lot more money, but not per citizen because there you have just a lot more people. So the nonprofit that I've run for a lot of years called Insight STEM, our goal is democratizing STEM knowledge through exploration, which, what does that mean? Democratizing means sharing and making available to everyone. STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. Knowledge includes skills, information, attitudes, and behaviors, and exploration through people being actually able to explore and understand that. So this is, has been my commitment for a long number of years about how we can make this science applicable around the world. And We've built up many things that go all around the world to try to include many people and try to actually democratize that knowledge. So you're not just doing the things that people think all the time, but like, you know, you can teach someone to fish. We'll get to that in a minute. You can teach someone some healthcare, but how can you get everyone involved in everyone? Everyone can be a STEM explorer and everyone should be a STEM explorer around the world. We have another problem in our lives that we live in the age where we relish having the free mainstream media and everyone is allowed to have their own views and opinions, but then we don't respect scientific knowledge in the same way that we respect people's right to have their opinions, which is also a big problem. I had these slides I pulled now from a talk I gave in 2017 in Turkey. So you can balance all this, but it's still true. These guys are still in government. Michael Gove still in the British government. But in 2017 was saying, I think that people have had enough of hearing from experts with what he literally said. So he doesn't want to hear what experts have to say. People have had too much to hear from experts. He doesn't want to hear it anymore. Literally in 2017, you had people saying this stuff about don't give people vaccines because they're going to give cancer. And believe me, 
I literally copied and pasted this slide today. This was not faked that I just made it up for this year for being appropriate to anti-vaxxers now. This was literally from 2017. Was the problem that people were saying that the problem is if you give people vaccines, they get cancelled. And the problem is it's really easy to prove everyone who's had a vaccine, everyone who gets cancer, look at anyone who's got cancer. They have all had a vaccine in their life. It is totally true. So therefore you can prove that vaccines definitely cause cancer because everyone with cancer has had a vaccine. But you have to really think about it. Like they would have died of something else first but they had the vaccine, so they haven't died of it. So now they got cancer. So now they've died of it. I Today, I really just downloaded this slide today, which was amazing to me that now we're doing this again. Also had this climate change conference, Paris Climate Agreement was happening then. Trump was pulling the US out of it. Syria had not signed it. Everyone else was in there in the Paris Climate Agreement about climate change because the US had decided that they didn't believe in climate change. A lot of people had joined it. Some people had signed it. Some people intended to sign it. Syria, which was not there. And this was the situation five years ago, which is hard to believe because now we seem to be in exactly the same state about all of these things based on science and technology on these global issues that where are we in the world about climate change? Now the US has rejoined the Paris Agreement, which we're supposed to be happy about, which was something from two years before that, that then they left, that then was there. We're supposed to now be happy that now we have a vaccine about a global pandemic, but still people in the world are arguing the same argument and still, people like Michael Gove are in British government arguing about how that you can't listen to experts because you need to listen to politicians and not scientific experts. And one of the big reasons for this is all about this argument that I'll make about the two plus two equals five situation, which is you have journalists that will say, you can say two plus, some scientists say two plus two equals five. You could make this a headline of your newspaper. And so journalism is all about like the shock revelation. Leading scientists can say two plus two equals five. If you go to court, you can argue, each side has to argue equally that two plus two equals five, two plus two equals four, you have equal time, equal, definition, then a jury has to say it, you can have a mistrial, all those things. Have a political argument where you can be on both sides of the debate, then your conclusion can be 2 plus 2 equals 5, two plus two, you can end up with 2 plus 2 equals 4.5 to be happy in between. And only in science are you saying that you've got these two things and then you've got four things and then you're asking another scientist to verify your two things and two things made you have four things. But in all of the other kinds of arguments, doesn't follow that scientific argument. It doesn't follow the same strategy. And when people are saying, oh, I don't believe in evolution, I don't believe in vaccines, I don't believe in the Big Bang, I don't believe in all these things, is not in the same way. Because scientifically, that's like this tiny part of issues that are within it and not within the whole thing, which is what all of the others believe that it's gonna be. Like me, as an astronomer, I believe the universe started in the Big Bang, which I'm fine with. I can't explain to you what happened at that first 10 to the minus 35 seconds at the start of the universe, nor can anyone else. And if anyone tells me that they can, I don't believe them because that is currently inexplicable to science. We don't understand it. But does it mean the universe started in this really small place, all thermally in contact, then expanded, then got really big? Yes, that's what happened. 
And so for walking down the street, does that mean the Big Bang? Yes, for sure. And so this making this argument equal on each side is always this problem. The same with whether your vaccine works or not, whether your face mask works or not, that's all the same thing. It's like, no, it's not 100% perfect, but yes, it does work a lot. Sorry, rant. Then you have, part of this comes to the black box of science and technology here from this show, The IT Crowd, which is in channel four from the UK. And this guy, Moss, presenting to his boss to take to a presentation, yes, this is the internet. And she presents, he presents her with this box with a flashing red light that is in charge of the internet and you shouldn't drop it on the floor. And this is the kind of mentality of the black box that happens in the world. So for that, we need everyone to be able to be science, technology, engineering, mathematics, literate, meaning you understand it, critically thinking global learners. The countries highlighted there are where we in my nonprofit and insights then we had students that are, and still do have students that are involved in what we're doing in those countries around the world and thinking about them and thinking about those issues in vastly different places and vastly different backgrounds that are all trying to make that kind of argument about you need to have this thinking that is not this judicial thinking, not this political thinking, not this journalistic thinking, but the scientific thinking about the issue. Like when someone tells you two plus two equals five, on what level are you taking it? From journalism, from law, from politics, or from science? And where are you putting that? So here you've got a fun activity for you to think about in your brain. So here is a hill for Dutch people. I know that's confusing, but <laughs> it's one of these things that comes out of the ground that you can put things on. And on this hill, there are houses that are built out of wood. So these trees that you can see have been chopped down and they've been made into these houses, such as these. So then the question to you is, to think about where does most of the mass of the wood that is in these houses come from? And you can choose whether it comes from the air, whether it comes from water, whether it comes from the ground, or whether it comes from sunlight. These being the four things that you needed to have your plant grow, like you've got your plant on your shelf, it needs these things, air, water, needs to be in the soil, needs sunlight, same happens for the trees. Same happens for these trees that I've chopped down to make my house from. So when I've made my house, where did this come from? I'm gonna give you 23 seconds to think about it. I can't see what fingers you're holding up. So I just have to trust you guys to vote yourselves. You can do one, two, three, four. I can only see one of you anyway. <laughs> and ask Stefan to stand up and look at everyone. Yes. Stare in their eyes and see what they're holding up, finger wise. Um. What's the What's the overall like? You can vote now. You see, like two people, like. Yeah, it's going to be four. Uh, people vote four. What? Like, Bart. Number two. Don't change your answers, just stick with it. Yeah, like very diverse. Maybe like 25% each answer or yeah. Yeah. 
two trees. Come on, guys, how many trees? Two three trees. Anyone else with three? No? So three ones, three trees. I'm also with well, I don't want to tell you guys I'm also with one. Do you have data on your answers now? <laughs> so, what's the result? Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Tell us. Tell me what you said. I can't hear you. Like he's saying it's one. But what was your votes like 25 25 oh. 25 25 or so like two people with one right? it was like three people with three three people with two uh two people with one what's that what's that yeah. like this kind of equal uh very few followers though very few followers like only one for i think yeah oh so no fours good group <laughs> <laughs> If you do this in a conference full of physics professors, you get the same thing happens. Biology professors, the same thing happens. I think Stefan already knows the actual answer. If you've seen it before, you know the actual answer. And the actual answer is that it's made out of air because carbon dioxide in the air is where all the carbon comes from that made the most of the mass in the houses. You can argue about whether it, other things, doesn't matter. This is the truth. So most of that came, almost all of this house was made out of air. People don't like it because, well, three quarters of you wanted other answers. Same in any group. And also because in your mental strategy, the air shouldn't make houses because, you know, air is air and houses are houses and that should not be a okay way to go. But almost all wooden houses therefore are made out of air. And if you look at the sweet little pig story, the houses made out of straw, also air, sticks, also air, bricks is made out of old rocks that are also made out of dead things that were made out of air. So everything is made out of air and you just have to get over it. Then you have like how we talk to people about what you're doing and how you're answering these. So how we treat people about what you're doing in science and how we ask people, what are you thinking? So here, this is a fair test, right? So the person who's going to get this grant, this job, this passes exam is who's going to climb the street. <laughs> so I think the monkey will win, but who knows? The elephant might make the way up there. But it's very important to also think about how you judge what's important in these things. If we go back to that also, if you look at the equation, a lot of biologists will be able to tell you that equation because it's from photosynthesis. A lot of chemistry people will be able to tell you it because it's there. Physics students, maybe not so much. Math students, not so much. And outside of the sciences, not at all. And then like, where does that importance come from? And like, how are you judging what you're looking for in this climbing up the tree? Then we look at the whole world. So as I was saying, in Flight STEM, we had these students around the world. This is where our students, campus ambassadors are distributed around the world. They're all self-connecting um, to each other. So everyone is only met by someone else and recruited by someone else. So we have this bizarre West African front, a bit of East Africa, some North, South America, a lot of India, and it's only students talking to each other and connecting themselves and being in this. And the point of it being that they want to share ideas, they want to be involved, and they want to share and be in that part of a global connection to that STEM knowledge from 
West and East Africa to North South America to India and Australia, where all of that access to science knowledge is very, very different in their education systems. And it's based on, you know, you see this, give a man a fish, you feed him for a day, teach a man to fish and you feed him for a lifetime. Okay, that's fine. But a lot of times we stop do at that point, especially when we're dealing with the global south, of thinking about where do you share more knowledge with the global south? When I go work in Liberia, should I be telling people more than, okay, I'm just going to teach you how to fish or I can teach you the science behind your fishery or should I be opening your eyes to you to the rest of the world? And should you be knowing about, you know, space medicine or these more beyond that issues? Because sure, you need this for your day-to-day -day life, but I think in the Western world, in the Northern world, we're very stuck in this idea that, you know, we're exactly stuck on this point that, okay, we're not going to give you a fish anymore, but we're just going to teach you to fish. But the point should be that that shouldn't be the end point. You should be absolutely letting you get to the next stages as well. And so looking at the sustainable development goals, absolutely should be doing these things across the board. I know you guys see them and you know them. And the way to get through them is to also be be, be teaching people beyond it. There's no point in stopping at the limit that you are at. You need to be also at the next stage beyond. And that's the same as we do in Europe and North America. It's the same thing that you're teaching people, especially in things like astronomy and whatever, that is like, it's impractical for your day-to-day -day life, but you need to have that stratosphere so that everyone is working up there. And the same you need, if you wanna have the same applying in the South, you need it in the South because you can't make that same limit. So we talk about this spectrum of diversity around the world is like how you deal with those different abilities and disabilities, how you deal with that socioeconomic diversity, how you deal with race and ethnicity and culture diversity, how you deal with gender and sexuality diversity, how you deal with international mobility and how you look at that global South issue and also lifetime and life, life, life Sorry, lifetime and lifelong long, can't say that in one script. Lifetime and lifelong learning in one go around the world, because you really have to care about this whole thing as one thing around the world and think about it around the world. So you really can't stop at just doing the one thing at a time or another thing at a time. And you can't think about doing it all just in Europe or North America. You have to be thinking about how do you do this around the world. And the Global South is pulled out there because of that spending thing that you saw at the beginning is a big issue. And also that, again, with the teach someone to fish argument, is like, if that's all you're doing for the Global South, then you've just got a lot of people who can fish. You're not making most of the population of your planet able to actually do all of these other things. And everything there is a culture. Oh, that's a good video. If it will play. I, I don't feel like you heard the, the sound of the video because we cannot hear the video. Okay. Uh, if you can't hear it, I'll play it later. But all watch life with Brian. It's good music. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I can make it go to the next slide on my own. 
but the point there is to say that um, he makes the point you're all individuals and they keep saying we're all individuals and then one guy says I'm not because the point is everyone's an individual everyone should be having their own thing individually but also you should think about everyone else being that individual too and how you connect them around the world as well and so getting to this slide we should we should make sure that we're democratizing knowledge helping this learning come between countries between nations across the global community and without that our fate might be sealed i mean we expect this little northwest nato bubble we live in possibly to be the thing but you know china russia india a huge masses of population and how you spread this democratization of knowledge is really important and the chinese certainly know it and they're currently spending massive amounts of money to do this in africa especially west africa where they're funding for so many west african students can go to china to study in chinese universities and things like that because china sees west africa as a place to be expanding and the rest of the world doesn't and we should think about these things in terms of how we talk about these intercultural connections. We have this scale that goes from denial of difference, defense of difference, minimization, acceptance, adaptation, and integration. Mostly in what we do, we're talking about minimization. We'll see in a minute. But this is really where you're thinking about how cultures interact how we're dealing with different people and how we're thinking about where you should say it like a lot of the time we spend denying uh -huh. that we should spend that money on african students because okay we don't think it should be there then we defend ourselves that it's like okay well we need to spend the money here instead and then we minimize the differences by saying no we're very very fair and reasonable So you can think about that in terms of where you have a global community, which we definitely do do, especially in the Netherlands, is think about, okay, everyone's equal, we're all here and here, instead of being this integrated community where we're actually re thinking about the encapsulation, constructive accepting of these different things. A lot of the time you're focused more on the left hand side of being like everyone is in this one bubble. And you can think about lots of people show you these pictures for your life about diversity, equity, accessibility, inclusion. That who looks at over who can see over this wall. You start off with the tall guy can see it and they all have little it's equality because they all have one box. It's accessibility because they have all boxes so they can see over inclusion so you can all see. Oh, there's arrows pop up to say that. But then if you look at it from the other side, you have to always think about what you can see, like who is there in your community that, you know, in the first picture, I can just see these two guys seeing over the wall so i'm happy everyone can see over the wall right then i can see everyone can see over the wall right and then i can see everyone see over the fence right so if i'm on this side of the wall you have to be very careful about what you're looking at because you can always be saying you can see all these people all the time and the first picture i have no idea the other person is there at all so every time you have to be worried about it do you even see it and then if you don't see it, are they even there? Because now this guy is the only guy there because he's the only guy you can see on the wall. Why would anyone else even bother showing? We did this in science, this chain of minimization that if you heard that clip, it said, we're all individuals, I'm not. But here, like everyone thinks they should be on this path, like bachelor's degree, master's degree, postdocs, 
being academics, who can be not in there. That's a big important thing. And look at all the pictures from the past that is like, this is showing you what scientists look like. If you change one person in that picture, you can immediately see who is a different person in that picture. And then be like, okay, why are they there? I don't know if you can hear this video. Can you hear it or not? Okay, well, we'll try to show you later, but Jan Levin, who's a very, very feminist astronomer, makes this video explaining gravity in five different levels. There's a lot of these videos about five different things. Very hard to make it go to the next page when it won't play. Yeah. Uh, no. no. So what she did in that was if you look she describes gravity in five different levels. So the child, the teen, the college student, grad student, expert. And if you, me, or anyone looks at those individuals, you can see the progression of them too. I cannot believe that Jan Levin was in this. He was one of the most feminist people I know. I cannot believe that she made this video, but she did. But this is the kind of message that you can inadvertently give to people about what you should understand, who should be to be able to understand at these different levels. And what we do, what I'm saying there is that we're trained minimizers. Like this is totally fine because, you know, we all know that this is all one thing and it's fine. And like everyone knows that, you know, Jana can be a PhD. She's more expert than this expert and whatever. But the point is that you're just doing this minimization of making that issue because where is, why isn't she the expert and someone else explaining it? So, you know, they've made a very broken situation there. And this comes to these things like the denial of difference between those different categories, that defense against those different categories, like, I worked harder where I am. This is what a lot of you are probably feeling all the time. I'm speaking their language, but they're still rude to me. When you're in cultures, I realize how much better the US is. It's probably not, you are not Americans, but whatever you came from, boy, could we teach these people a lot of stuff. Then you have the minimization of the difference. There's no, there's no issues here. This is what we do most of the time. We are not racist. We are not in these. We are not doing these things, which is where we are pretty much at in this minimization state. Then you can have the acceptance of it, where you start working with those, so you're understanding those different things. When you do not study abroad, when you've homestay with different families, when you've worked with different cultures, you start accepting these differences really happen. And then adapting to it, how do you put that into the whole picture overall, which is really, really hard. And how do you make sure that integration is happening? Because we are trained in that minimization. So thinking about that in the whole worldwide stage is really difficult because as you're thinking about who are you talking to, what is happening in these different countries, how are they being supported in this whole science, technology, engineering, and education point of view, like those guys in West Africa, are you really just gonna teach them about how to go fishing? Or are you gonna teach them about space med medicine? Because there's no chance they're ever gonna work in space medicine, but is it still valid to make that be something that you can teach them? What about all around the world, the same kind of issues? The same thing as we get there, are we getting there? This sustainable development goals were on the way to 2020, which we're now in 2022. So where are we on that? So now talk and ask questions. All right, thank you very much. Um...
Uh, on this website, you can write a code like uh, 567642. Um, and then I'll be able to read out your question to this. I make you bigger so you can come and ask the question to the camera, wherever it is. Um, yeah. yeah, I can give you Wi-Fi if you need. Yes, I can. I have the university. Yeah. 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 Every question is welcome, even completely random. <laughs> Or comment um, or thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> we have the, the first question. Um, how much does the economic state of countries influence how much they democratize, democratize uh, STEM learning? It goes up and down. <laughs> so the I would say only like the G20 countries can afford to really invest in it. And within them, there's a big affluent difference. And even countries not in the G20, like if you look at the top 20 spenders on that, on science at all, is, sorry, going all the way back to that slide. Oh, no, like per, per person in your country, everyone thinks the US is the most, but there are countries that are more per person, though they have lower populations, not necessarily in the Netherlands, but lower than this group, it becomes really, really small. And then where you get from there becomes a problem about what, how do you deal with that? All right. Um, I was wondering, like, how did you get interested um, in this field? Like, why democratize, like, um, democratizing or like STEM learning comes to your interest? Well, because I think that it's really important and especially working with people in all of the countries that aren't colored in, in this diagram <laughs> is really important to know like what they're thinking, how you can connect and what they're going to do. Because, mm -hmm. you know, their populations are huge. And it's much more effective if there is science, scientifically literate population, not because, so I think in this set of countries, the point is that you can make a lot of money out of it. But I think what you actually wanna do is not destroy the planet or have humans have happy survivable lives. And both of those things need to be everywhere else, need to be cheaper, and rely on you understanding that science a lot more. All right, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, what is the best way to solve the problem, or at least better the democratization of STEM? 
I don't know what is a good way to solve it. All of you guys go help do it. <laughs> I at least improve it, you know. I mean, it relies on, I think, individuals prepared to do it at this point because there's, you know, there's a big lack of that transition. It takes a lot. So, you know, if you want to go do voluntary service overseas or something for two years after you do your degree, that's absolutely what you should do because that's the only way that you can start in those, especially like West African countries, South American countries, in actually instilling that kind of education too, and also making them see that kind of education too, making their universities see that kind too. Like, for example, I work in Liberia a lot with a lot of Liberian students. There is no university in Liberia that has a PhD program in anything. Mm -hmm. So if you want to do a PhD and you're a Liberian, you can't be in Liberia to do it. So the only way to start motivating it is to be there and be, this is something that happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Um how long has this conversation been going on for? Is democratizing, democratizing STEM a recent thing or has it been a discussion for a while? It's a complicated question. <laughs> <laughs> I think in modern terms, it's a feature of the 2000s, which probably you guys don't think is that new, but <laughs> in that lifetime. But technically it has been forever. I mean, why did the Dutch colonize Indonesia? Because they knew how to grow coffee or spice <laughs> is, you know, that's a technical field, <laughs> coffee growing. <laughs> That's why the UK conquered all the other places that the Netherlands didn't because they wanted tea instead of coffee. But <laughs> <laughs> so there's positive and negative attitudes towards it too. So I think you have to be careful in the past. And that's why I think there's also, you know, some issues there about democratizing knowledge is you don't want to do it in a dodgy way like it was in the past and that's why I, a lot of countries are now worried about what China is doing in West Africa because they're pretty much doing what you could consider that the West had done in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, is there some progress in spreading STEM education and who are the key, key players in this challenge? There kind of is the only nonprofit organizations, United Nations. Mm -hmm. Then there are like the EU does a lot. A lot of government agencies in the US does a lot, but in terms of global thinking, not a lot. Mm -hmm. In terms of your isolated bubble, more and more, but that's not helping you. Mm -hmm. And do you think like the help is like efficient? With in the EU or the US, yes. <laughs> outside of that no okay um because there's i mean there's a lot of trying to trying to do stem education in west africa for example is massively hard and would take a lot of money but no one is paying for it for sure mm -hmm. because what you want to pay for is rubber and oil, gas, minerals, and then you don't need people to be educated to do that. Yeah, that's a fair point. 
Um, next question is um, saying this in the world's most developed nations, say they don't have enough funding. How are they going to convince the country to give money to the others? Well, that's what I was just saying. <laughs> I don't know, you tell me. Come up with a good idea. This is this is where you're <laughs> the future. Yeah, um... I mean, the only... The, the way to do it is because, you know, you have this human resources. So you've got people who can actually do all these things better and could actually make all of these things more profitable and more equitable all the time. If you gave them the education to be able to do it. And if you gave them the healthcare professionals to look after them. And if you gave them the social welfare to be able to support that society who is then producing you the things you wanted that would then give you that economic benefit. But if you're in a capitalist economy, that doesn't work for you. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> um, next question is, uh, isn't fight denial limitable if we no longer platform to the voices that say two plus two equals five? You discuss the debate as trial with equal sides. It's not true, is it? Can you say that again? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Isn't fact denial limitable if we no longer platform to the voices that say two plus two equals five? You discuss the debate as trial with equal sides. Is not true, is it? We well, have to, I think, teach people about the different ways that debates work and that a scientific debate is different to a legal debate, especially, and a political debate, like when you, when the media wants to show a debate, they have to be neutral. So what is neutral in a debate? And what is neutral in a political debate is like, these guys say this and these guys say this, and we would listen to both sides and then we're neutral. But in a scientific debate, it's not like that. It's very, very different. It's usually about a tiny point inside it to start off with. And secondly, it's normally 98%, about 2%. So it's not like with climate change, do you think climate change happens? 99% yeah. of scientists say yes. 2% of scientists say no. They might be right in the end. And the problem is the 98% of the scientists also say, okay, yeah, those 2% could be right all the time. But then when you put them, you know, in a news debate on TV, you're putting this guy against this guy. So now it looks 50-50, but it's not 50-50. It's 98 to two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the same with the Big Bang at the start of the universe. It's like, yes, it did happen. It was small, tiny, and then exploded and blah, blah, blah. That's 100% of people say that. Do we know what happened in that? 0% of people say that. But then you can put them together and be like, oh, so no one can tell you what happened at this exact zero moment. But 100% people agree what happened the next moment. So we'll just focus on the one moment and say, okay, well, then we can just put that down to something else. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, next question is, how could we dem democratize access to research? It would be obvious, obviously nice to make all the research open source, but that might drain funding for scientific research. Yes. So, <laughs> good point, good question. And I mean, I don't know what the solution is. And being in the Netherlands, you're in the best place in the world for it, as they have gold standard open access and everything and also pay tons of money for everyone for all of the things for open access but we try to make like we were having a book club for our inclusion and diversity european astronomical society committee but we can't do it because they can't all read the books and stuff because they cost too much money because only the Netherlands has the deal with Springer that every single thing is free. Mm -hmm. 
because the Netherlands is ninjas about making it happen. But that also sucks if you're in that whole swath of the world, you can see that's not coloured in there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, uh, can you tell us a, in a bit more detail about how your organization works? Insight STEM? I mean, it doesn't really work very effectively, but <laughs> it works by students talking to other students and students helping each other around the world of being collaborating together, finding each other opportunities mm -hmm. in a completely eclectic and uncoordinated way. Why we have 300 in West Africa, why we have 300 in India is only because they talk to each other and decide that was what they were doing. There's, mm -hmm. it's right. completely random. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice. lovely, but it's rent. <laughs> All right. Um, what are good ways of develop developing countries to keep the people who are highly educated and prevent brain drain? Yeah, that is a massively huge issue. Is so if you want to focus on these countries, then. You know, you need the whole structure, not just you can do this degree, then you're going to go somewhere else. Because then you have that brain drain issue, which is what has happened for Africa for years. What is now in the new Africa happening. The China policy for Africa is to fly all of these African students to China for them to do their degrees and higher degrees in China and then fly them back to Africa to then be there reporting to the Chinese government all the time afterwards. And mm -hmm. we're currently in stage one of that and stage two of that, they'll all come back in about three years time. So we'll see what happens. But that's China's attitude towards it, which is Actually, in terms of brain drain, a very sensible policy, <laughs> but in terms of what you may think global democratizing knowledge wise, this is maybe not the best only strategy for all of these countries to have. But currently, China is the only country that is doing that for West Africa. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> all right. Um, is there also a role which universities in developed nations can play in? helping to increase STEM education in developing countries. Yes. <laughs> and we By should... doing that or... <laughs> I mean, making those partnerships, having students that come, but especially in the previous point, making sure they go back. I mean, a very bad part of the EU and US is that you that we get students from third world countries and once they come stay forever so you're not repopulating that the only country that is doing the other is China so I think you need to do that but that has to be followed up with other things like if I want to give the African student a grant to come study in the Netherlands why would they then want to go back to the Africa? So there you need like also to have your government give support to that infrastructure. <clears throat> so oh, you're going back to something that like, I've trained you to go run this lab in your country. <clears throat> all right. Um, yeah, this was the, all the questions we I got from the audience. Um, so thank you very much for a very interesting, um, kind of pretty refreshing um, lecture. I mean, comparing what we usually have. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your time uh, and good luck uh, with your research and your work as well. You're very welcome. Yes, thank you. Thank you like, all for coming uh, as well. Uh, after the announcement, and um, like the announcement, we go to Barcelona. Uh,
um, yeah, and that was good to see some of you as well over there. Uh, next Monday, we have lecture, a um, very nice uh, international scholar from the day about South Africa and how um, they cope with like racist and for like more than 25 years of um, upper like ago. They moved from uh, upper tide. Um, next, we'll start. Uh, next next week we'll start at Kizil and the first thing will be um what's the name? Lulu Clues, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Lulu Clues are meant for Soxy. Um after that we'll have uh, another lecture organized by Axi about Western Balkans and youth politics and that. Um also I forgot to mention we'll have next Monday social event organized by the Bulletin Metro as your party mix. Um, Sanas are open, sounds very cool. Um, great, great time. It's going to be also hybrid form, same as um, New York Street. So it's going to be amazing. So I also hope to see you over there. And thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.